Hey everybody, and thanks for coming to this next WordStream webinar, The State of Digital Marketing, six, six Tips to Get Your Google and Facebook Back on Track. I'm really excited for this uh, presentation today because we've got Mark Irvin on the line, who is a PPC expert, senior data scientist, super knowledgeable um, about all of this, and has been working at WordStream for a while. So he is the guy to tell us about all of the new tips that we can use to help get our marketing back on track in this in this crazy world that we're in right now. Um, so with that, I'll just run through some housekeeping. Um, so for those of you on the line who are maybe new to the WordStream brand, you may have found us through our blog or um, any of our content that's truly incredible. But what some people might not know is that we also have a software that allows you to manage your Google, Bing, and Facebook all from one place. So it kind of streamlines that pro that process makes it a lot easier to understand the data and make decisions by using our um, machine learning to kind of help you on that process. And then also before we get into the content, I just want to put up this screen, stay connected with us. We are in a digital and virtual world right now and social media traffic and usage is on the rise. So please stay connected with WordStream too on Facebook, Twitter, all the things you see on the screen right now. And last but not least, um, of course, this is being recorded and the webinar materials, the recording, the slides, all of that will be sent to your inbox um, within the next 24 hours. Um, and also, while we're here, please submit your questions today. We want to hear from you. We want to make sure that this is helpful and um, beneficial for all of you on the line. So please engage with us. We can't wait to hear from you. Um, and with that, I will pass it back off to Mark. Excellent. Thank you, Amanda. Guys, I'm so excited to, to be here today to talk about everything going on. Um, I do have a special announcement, one little bit of the logistics. You will notice at the bottom of your screen, today we are testing out some live subtitles, um, some closed captioning. The idea of this is, well, firstly, I have an awful Boston accent, and many of you would prefer not to listen to my voice. That's there for you. The other idea is, of course, that this makes the entire presentation more accessible um, to people on different devices who might not be able to hear the audio, or to people of different abilities who might um, have some audio uh, impairment. So by all means, if it's distracting, shoot that commentary through the, the Q&A. Otherwise, I hope it benefits the entire presentation. Um, but beyond that, guys, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, my name is Mark Irvin. I'm the Senior Data Scientist at WordStream. It's a really great title. It's a really cool title. Of course, WordStream is an online uh, paid search, paid social management platform. It allows us to make a lot of prescriptive suggestions um, to help people optimize and see what uh, what they can do with paid search and paid social online. Um, as a senior data scientist, I have the unique opportunity of not just looking at one account and seeing those trends in one account, but looking across our 30,000 WordStream client accounts across Google, across Bing, across Facebook, and see what kinds of trends people are reacting to um, as it relates to COVID and as it relates to new features and as it relates to 2020 being such a dynamic point in time. Um, with all of that data and with the support of both the WordStream community and our broader broader uh, community as well, I was recently voted the most influential PPC expert of 2019. I'm up for it again in 2020, um, so I'm very excited about that. All of that didn't happen overnight, though. I am celebrating what is my eighth year anniversary in paid search uh, this week and my seventh year anniversary at WordStream this week. Very exciting milestones. And during that period of time, you know, I've gone through a lot. I've seen Google introduce enhanced campaigns and expanded text ad formats and double expanded text ad formats, responsive search ads, um, new keyword match types. A whole lot has changed over the last couple of years. And I've been able to do a lot of data as those things changed in real time. But guys, the last eight years could not prepare me for what was going to happen in 2020. I don't think that it's a controversial statement to say that, wow, coronavirus was bad, guys. Um, and we saw that both, hey, in the news and public health and what's going on in the world around us, but we also noticed it in our paid search campaigns as well. Now, that's not to say that there's not tons of opportunity, though. When we look at where we are today, 
and what's changed in the last couple of months. There's a lot of great trends that, although might be bad for Google or Microsoft or Facebook, are actually really great opportunities for advertisers. So when we look across our client accounts right now, we see that the cost to advertise is down 15% across the board, across Google, across Bing, across Facebook since March. So we saw that Google cost per clicks have fallen about 20%. They're beginning to rise, but they're still considerably lower than what they previously were. We see the fact that Bing fell as well and is, remains appreciably cheaper than Google is. And we're seeing very similar trends on the Facebook side as well. While all these costs are down, we're actually seeing the fact that a lot of people are still getting the same level of conversions or about the same level of conversions as they previously were. So we're up to about 95% of what they were pre-COVID when we go back to February, um, but some advertisers are doing even better. Google and Facebook, they just released free ad credits to a lot of advertisers um, that's rolled out to New Zealand and Germany and Taiwan and Italy, um, and it's going to continue to roll out to to a lot of advertisers globally in the next couple of weeks, including the Americas and the UK. Um, and what we were seeing is the fact that because there's all these new opportunities and because costs are so much lower, we are seeing this potential that ROI is up on a lot of paid search campaigns and many are able to do much more for much less than they had previously paid for before. And so, there's this adage that goes around when we start talking about advertising in an economic downturn. And the adage basically reads, when times are good, you should advertise. When times are bad, you must. And we've seen that in the past, when we look at trends here, this is you know, one of the more commonly cited studies that people look at, but the McGraw-Hill research, um, they looked at 600 companies advertising in the 80s when the 1982 recession really began to hit. And here in green, what we saw is we saw the sales of the, of the companies that in fact grew or maintained their advertising during that period of time. We saw that those were the companies that grew during a recession, whereas those that cut back or reduced or eliminated their advertising actually felt more the brunt of the recession and consequently lower sales volume. So, if you think about the brands that you know that are household names today, the Coca-Colas, the uh, Kellogg's, um, Facebook, Instagram, all of these companies that are household names to us today, Amazon, um, those all are companies that really leaned into advertising growing during a recession. And we see the fact that like this is now a beautiful time that if you're smart about how you advertise, you can come out of what's about to happen far stronger than entering it. And so with that, I do want to start talking about how to do that successfully. Very first thing is it's probably time, no, sorry, not probably, it's time to update and test some new ad formats, right? So it's very possible that the ads you had um, back in February and the campaigns you were planning back in Q1, you know, they feel dated quickly. Um, it is very easy to have ads that were previously best performers a month ago, now carry new unintentional messages or undesired imagery. The idea here is someone searching for a virus check, you know, six months ago, they're probably looking for exactly what we were thinking about and what this ad was written for. But virus check in the middle of a pandemic um, very likely means something else and carries a completely different message behind it. So how this, this advertiser chooses to show on this keyword or if they show, choose to show on this keyword has some meaningful consequences. On the display and social side, I saw this ad um, not too long ago uh, for, for a local uh, chicken wings place near us, um, but it reads feed your friends. Whether it's the big game or a Wednesday, bring your favorite people together for your favorite chicken. And guys, oh, that ad hurts. Um, there aren't two words that uh, really feel good together, whether it's the bring your friends together, um, the big game, a lot of that messaging feels really dated and quite frankly, uh, in, in the opposite taste that I'm sure that, that this ad hopes to string, uh, reach people today. So it's a good time to review your ads, even if you think that they, they weren't written 
as obtusely as this, it's just a good time to review your ads for some, some common messaging. Particularly on Google, Google has a very uh, strict way of how it goes about messaging things right now. Um, and it has a number of new ad policies. It doesn't want people, it doesn't want people to look like they're benefiting off of a public health disaster, right? So it specifically doesn't allow um, phrases like coronavirus or COVID-19 in them, um, but even verbs like horde or dying, um, people are dying to get in, people are uh, hoarding these, these new treats, those kinds of things are sensitive um, in that language and you, those are a beautiful time to revisit your verb choice there as well. Um, even if not so deaf as that, there are still plenty of opportunity to revisit a number of your, your previously performing ads. Um, obviously, we didn't have a March Madness, we're not going to have an Olympics. You wanna be very careful about how you message towards the current events. Um, and you also want to be very cautious about how you message in, in ways that are counter to social distancing practices. Um, your perfect getaway or to share with all your friends or visit us or shop in store, those kinds of messages very likely have less value than they did previously or mean something different as we are approaching a new a new normal, right? Images that include people who are close together, shaking hands, touching, leaning on each other. Um, those, those are things that we do need to think a little bit more cautiously as it's something that isn't as relatable. Like we now, it's now very easy for us to identify ads that were created six months ago versus ads that were created in the last three. Um, so it's a beautiful time to review a lot of your value props and the benefits. Um, if you can offer things like free or timely delivery, it's a great time to, to mention that as a lot of places cannot. Most notably, Amazon cannot deliver on its prime two-day delivery. And so if you can do anything to compete with a, a backlogged Amazon, or you have things in stock, or you have things in limited stock, um, the fact that you have those in stock really means a whole lot as a whole lot of companies hit those supply chain issues. That suddenly becomes a value prop, whereas previously that was an assumed condition. Um, how you go about messaging about you being local or how you perform in home services, these things mean a whole lot more to us now in the current light than they may have meant in the past. So a lot of your ad testing from previous that led you to the greatest ads of 2019, you know, maybe it's time to revisit a whole lot of how you position yourself today. And it's really important to think about this, not just in how you write your ads to an audience, but think about how all the audiences are looking to you. A big problem with search marketing is that keywords don't capture intent. So if I choose to serve an ad to this keyword for air conditioning repair, Google's very proud and very happy to show that ad to everyone who is searching for air conditioning repair. But a challenge with serving an ad to everyone is that everyone is slightly different. And so a homeowner and a renter have very different means of what they're looking for when they're looking for air conditioning repair. Um, I'm a renter, so I really don't care at all about how much this is gonna cost because that's gonna be my landlord's problem. Whereas my landlord can tell you that he has very different opinions on that subject matter. Um, my parents who own a home have a very different take on that. An essential business owner who is looking to fix this is completely different in how they go about um, getting this so that they can remain in business versus a restaurant owner who might not be open or might be looking to reopen in the next, um, next couple of months. The contractor, the architect, your past customers, people in cold weather and warm weather, they're all looking for different solutions when they're looking for the same keyword. So it suddenly becomes very difficult to write one ad that speaks to all of their particular needs. So when you're writing your ads, don't try to write the single perfect ad here. That's kind of a fool's errand, right? You're not going to be able to, in 300 characters, write everything that everyone might need from this and prop it um, as, as you'd like to. Instead, think about writing different ads for different personas. So you're going to have like that mass market audience. We're all gonna have that mass market audience and very likely our price is going to be the most uh, sensitive thing towards 
towards what that audience is looking like. And we might have this mass market audience that performs very well with that kind of messaging. But some people are going to be additionally sensitive um, around the, the virus, right? Um, whether they have pre-existing conditions or whether they're elderly or whether or not they, they are just more cautious about this. Um, how you go about propping that you are safe and that you are sanitary, um, that messaging means a whole lot more to some people than others. That persona of a closed business who is looking for this, they might be looking not for an immediate solution, but they're looking for a solution that allows them to schedule some time in the future. Um, some of us are going to be economically stressed. If we have financing options, it's a beautiful time to reach to promote that to that audience. How we speak to our past audiences, uh, our past customers, suddenly all of these different personas are worth revisiting, both in terms of who they are and what they need in the current time. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a case that we write the very best ad for all of these people. But just by testing more ads in an ad group, we see that we increase the likelihood of someone clicking on any one of them by about 21% on average. That by giving Google more variety in terms of how it can message our ads, um, suddenly we open ourselves up to how Google can match that to that particular audience. And that begets a whole new level of testing for us, right? Recently, Google. Um, Google and WordStream started this support for responsive search ads. And responsive search ads are a really exciting opportunity, particularly now, um, given the fact that responsive search ads allow us to provide up to 15 headlines and up to four descriptions. It gives us a whole lot of opportunity to write a bunch of, um, a bunch of messages that we might not normally include within our ads. And then Google will automatically test and optimize for all of those different variations. Now, the math behind all of this is that 15 headlines and four descriptions, you can permutate that in over 43,680 different variations of your ads. And you can ultimately do better at matching who is going to be sensitive to what kind of message and find a better match for a lot of these fringe audiences that you wouldn't normally think to test for. So this gives Google a whole lot more opportunity to cater your ads towards specific users, towards specific devices, towards specific keywords or search terms or search behaviors that we as people might not be able, I hope that no one's going out and testing 43,000 individual pieces of ad copy against this. Um, it, gives, it just opens up a whole new realm of opportunity for how we go about a better message match to what people are searching for. Now, Google is of course, not just reaching us with these responsive search ads, which are a text ad format, but recently they started rolling out these image ad extensions as well. The idea here is that in our text ads, we can also show this image. And that image can be a product, it can be um, pictures of people interacting with our service, whatever best represents that ad. Um, and we are seeing pretty positive search results from this. Early, search, uh, early tests are showing that these images have a 5% increase in uh, click-through rate. And so it's a great opportunity to just do more with our existing ad copy. Of course, um, our, our existing ad copy only supports for 300 characters. If a picture is worth a thousand words, we more than, more than uh, quadruple the amount of information we can convey here, right? Beyond that, as we talk about the display network, same kinds of conversations. Um, how you go about messaging yourself across the display network means a whole lot more today. Um, you want to make sure that you're able to reach people in all of their their networks, in all of their um, placements, across search, across social, across display with images, with video, with text. Responsive display ads are a great way to scale that reach of an individual ad so that it can show across far more placements and so you can test a whole lot more images. And we see that the more diverse images you have, the more Google can test and optimize towards that. And so we do have this free tool that allows advertisers um, to just go to wordstream.com backslash smart ads creator, and they're able to scan their website and we're able to automatically create um, several common popular image format uh, ads for HTML5 image ads for um, 
the Google Display Network or their social ads. That's a free tool. You can get started with it today. Um, and within the WordStream software, we add on to that, allowing you to easily manage and edit that, edit the text within it, and create ads using um, Shutterstock in integration. And so there's a lot that you can do. And as you do that, this is a beautiful time to think more about how you reach your audience with images and um, branch out from what you're comfortable with. And so it's a beautiful time. Hey, we're halfway through 2020. We are entering Gay Pride or we're in the middle of Gay Pride Month. And we are having some important conversations about what representation and equality look like in America and abroad. This is a beautiful time for you as a brand to refocus what your advertising looks like and how you're choosing to represent different audiences in your ad as well. What we see, and this is not from a, a fancy schmancy uh, marketing firm. This is not from a branding consultant. This is from Microsoft Advertising, or um, some of you might know it as Bing. But we see the fact that a lot of genuinely, if we want to have people see themselves using our product or becoming customers, it really does help for them to see themselves or someone like them using your product or customers. Um, so we see the fact that by having representation in advertising, having your brand include more than one image of a user or having diverse users included in your advertising, um, having people feel like they are being marketed to or that your brand is being inclusive of them, not just increases the trust among some number of sectors, but it also increases the likelihood that they're going to support that brand and become advocates of that brand. And of course, not only is this super important for how your brand reaches those audiences and makes them feel like they're potential customers, but it does reflect even towards other audiences that as you include ethnic minorities, LGBT, people of different abilities um, in your advertising that all sectors, even majority sectors, even white men, um, white able-bodied cis men, um, find a lot of comfort in seeing the fact that you are reaching a diverse audience. And so you want to in, uh, make sure that representation is included in your advertising and it feels genuine. This is not tokenism. This is how do you go about reaching that audience um, and treating them equally. And we see the fact that there's a large lift in purchase intent across all audiences by including uh, representation in your advertising and thinking about representation um, as a brand. So we updated our ads. Now we got to talk about all the things that are changing and how people are searching and engaging with us online. And so very genuinely, our lives are very different in 2020 than they were in 2019. Half of humanity being under a stay at home order um, has some meaningful impact of what we're doing with our uh, time today. So the very first is what we've been searching has changed a lot. Normally when we have this conversation about Google and what people are searching for on Google, um, people search Google 3.5 billion times a day, 15% of those searches are have never occurred on Google before that's changed even more in the past couple of months. When we look at what's uh, been trending on Google, we saw that coronavirus related searches became the single most popular searches throughout March and April. That spike there um, on the graph in blue, we see that it becomes more popular than people searching for the weather or for Gmail or for Facebook or for news or for politics or for sports. That became the number one story and the number one search trend by far for six weeks. What we've seen is recently that's declined considerably and that uh, it's still a very popular search term, but it's now more in line with what we see for Gmail. People are still searching for coronavirus. There's still um, tons of new searches that are happening. We see that nearly one in four searches that happen today have never searched for before. Um, but it's still, it's becoming less 
important, but it's still very important. Um, so this is quickly changing. It changes on the regular. Um, there's this tool. If you go to the Google Trends Coronavirus Hub, feel free to search for that. Um, it's updated weekly. It will show you what the most popular search is as it relates to coronavirus and the tertiary searches such as opening up or the, the most trending searches um, across the United States or in any particular region. Beyond what we've been searching for, how we've been searching has also changed considerably. Now, we are spending a whole lot more time on a stay at home order, staying at home. Where uh, in these states are, these stats are for the United States, but if you were to go to the Google Mobility Reports, you can see this for any particular state or region. Um, we're in the United States, we're spending an average of 14% more time than previous at home and about a third or about 40% less time at transit or going to a, an office or to a workplace. And so because we're staying home more and because we're traveling less and we're less mobile, it means the fact that we're also searching different. When we're at home, we're far more likely to search on a desktop than we are to search on a mobile phone. And so consequently, we're seeing that shift from mobile traffic to desktop traffic all of a sudden. How we go about positioning ourselves to a mobile user is a little bit differently than how we go about positioning ourselves to a desktop user. So it's worth thinking about. And as people are using desktops, a lot of us are using PCs or Windows powered devices. And those Windows powered devices generally default to some kind of Bing search engine. Um, so we're seeing that Bing search traffic suddenly growing, whereas we wouldn't normally expect that during this, this time. Um, and where people are searching is also quickly changing. If you previously had a strategy where you were targeting people, um, professionals, you're a B2B company, and you're targeting professionals in city centers or city hubs, if you're trying to reach um, WordStream or a number of companies in the financial district, downtown Boston, you'd be disappointed that you can't reach us there, um, as a lot of us have moved out to the suburbs where we normally live and consequently, um, the search targeting of a lot of, like if you target Manhattan, you're reaching a very different audience than how you previously would have reached um, beforehand. So where people are searching is also changing as well. And it's very important to revisit some of your campaign settings to make sure that you're not targeting an overly specific region, given the fact that your stakeholders have physically moved since the beginning of February. And finally, when we search is quickly changing as well. Whereas previously we saw a whole lot of search, like you had the, the search history um, for years that people wake up, they begin searching um, on their way to work and they continue to search a whole lot more during the day and then a whole lot less during the evening. Well, all of a sudden as people are not commuting and as people are staying up later, sleeping in later, these search trends are quickly shifting. And so, people are 10 times more likely, or 10%, sorry, 10% more likely to search on these off hours and on the weekends than they previously were, particularly during that late night hours of uh, 12 to 3 a.m. Um, there's a whole lot more new searches during that period of time. And that has some meaningful consequences to us uh, who may have normally excluded or advertised during that point in time because the admittedly wasn't a whole lot of search traffic before, and now it's becoming a much larger share of search traffic. And we see the fact that those aren't always the greatest hours. Um, what I'm searching for at 1 a.m., I'm always not, I'm not always uh, in the best condition to make that purchase at 1 a.m. either. So it's worth revisiting your ad schedules, making sure that those are accurate and that you're reaching the right audience and those are performing as well as they were before as well. But broadly, the themes that we're seeing right now all conclude to the fact that PPC campaigns are rebounding. Um, I mentioned earlier in May, we saw that advertisers saw about 94, 95% of the conversions that they had in February on average. Um, since mid-April, conversion rates have really increased across a number of industries and most industries in, in fact, um, particularly in the United States. Um, Mid-April is when you saw the first of the economic stimulus plans go out, the CARES Act begin to roll out. Um, and that's really helped rebound a lot of conversion rates as people have more confidence and more income to go out and put money into the economy. We've seen 
Most recently uh, on our blog, we updated a lot of our benchmarks across the last three months. Um, and we're seeing the fact that like most industries have some positive gains from the new normal, particularly online. Tech, apparel, beauty, entertainment, finance, gifts, among many industries that are seeing appreciably higher significant um, growth and higher conversion rates while benefiting from a lower cost per click. And so this is a great time. Of course, as like it means that we're not going to be able to reach a lot of people in store or through our traditional means of advertising, but digitally, we have a lot of flexibility to turn on and off our campaigns and to make these adjustments to reach people where they are searching for us right now. This has some meaningful implications for local businesses. So it's a very interesting thing, particularly when we start talking about retail or local businesses. Um, it's true that local businesses are rebounding as places begin to reopen, um, store visits, foot traffic, traffic to their website, all of this is rebounding, um, but it's still not rebounding to what it used to be. So whereas during a, the early days of a stay at home order, we might've seen retail uh, visits down 40, 45%. Now they're only down 23% and they're continuing to grow, but they've got a long path to recovery before we have the new normal for what retail and brick and mortar look like. Increasingly, people are searching online, even just to confirm that these kinds of locations are open. So now more than ever, it suddenly becomes important to make sure that you're optimized for local search. You wanna make sure to start off that your Google My Business profile is complete, it's accurate, and it's optimized. It's one thing to have a Google My Business up and to claim your site and to get you on Google Maps and to make sure that you show up in local search results, but it's another thing to have meaningful information there. Um, here, when you look at the left versus the right, Ernie's Electric, gives us a whole lot more information and gives me a whole lot more confidence as a consumer that this is a very genuine business that is up and operating and operating regularly. Um, like I said, I know that there are a lot of businesses near me, even as, they, even as the state tells them that they can reopen, I don't know for certain what businesses are and aren't open during this point in time. I'm going to go to Google or Facebook or Twitter to confirm the fact that they're posting and that they're posting their updated hours and anything that I need to know about before I head out there. Um, this is a beautiful time. Google's actually released a whole lot of new attributes and support for Google My Business in the last couple of months so that you can adjust your hours for COVID so that you can post um, any additional information that you have as it relates to your reduced operations or to things that we should expect when we arrive there, whether or not you're available for in-store pickup or curbside pickup or whether or not you're available for dining or takeaway or what have you. This is, um, there's no penalty for updating this stuff. I know that in the past, Google had um, implied that there was penalty for reducing your hours or for changing this frequently. That's not the case anymore. Um, we are publishing a whole lot recently about how on our blog, about how local businesses can maintain their Google My Business profile. And in the coming months, we'll have a whole lot more free tools for advertisers to make sure that they're managing their Google My Business and that they're following best practices for updating their Google My Business. So by all means, stay tuned. All of your Google My Business stuff, there's no cost to show for this. It's just good to show um, and that there's no ads associated with this or that there's no requirement to advertise with this. Um, so it's, it's very genuinely just a great place to start particularly as you go about reopening your businesses and having that conversation with your customers. But now as we're spending so much more time online, there's plenty of more opportunity to reach people across networks. So Google is going to be Google. You're going to reach everyone who searches on Google and we're seeing that most people we're still able to reach most people on Google. People are still searching on Google all the time. Um, the average person, the average advertiser is reaching 94% of their audience that they were um, back in February today. 
still, um, there are plenty of opportunities outside of Google where people are in fact finding new opportunities to expand. Bing is doing very similar to how it was before all of this. More people are searching on Bing than ever. There's still a significant opportunity to reach um, people on Bing or on search partners. But outside of search, when we look at the display network, when we look at YouTube, when we look at shopping, um, there's a whole large audience that is online more than ever. And there's plenty of more opportunity to reach them on these kinds of networks. So display, social video, they have increased traffic. And this has some meaningful consequences for how people engage with your brand, not just when they're searching, but even before or after they search. How do you re-engage with someone who abandoned that shopping cart or abandoned your site and get them to come back to your site? Or how do you encourage someone to first search for you in the, begin in the first place? Um, display, YouTube, those are great opportunities to get in front of those audiences. And most recently, I wanna say it was like a week or so ago, um, but Google released the highly anticipated discovery campaigns to all advertisers. And so Google announced discovery campaigns as a beta back at Google Marketing Live in 2019. Almost a full year later, they released it to all advertisers. Discover campaigns allow you to show your ad across YouTube, across Gmail, but for the very first time ever, it allows advertisers to reach users on the Google Discover page, right there, as you can see on the left, below the search bar. So these ads reach people right before they're about to make a search. And so it's a beautiful time to begin to introduce your brand um, to people right before they make a search, really impact that behavior in terms of what they're looking for online. You might choose, like this might change how someone searches for this kind of skincare um, and specifically even search for your brand name rather than searching for the keyword skincare or something like that. Because it reaches these high impact placements um, using audience targeting, Smart bid management makes optimization very easy here. What we see across all advertisers is that the average CPA from this kind of discovery campaign is only $12.19. Um, part of that is because it is such a new campaign type that it is a first move, uh, early mover's advantage. But beyond that, because it's so influential in terms of reaching the right audience in the moments before they search, there's some really positive results to not just how um, they engage with these ads themselves, but how it changes their behavior later on. So if you haven't heard of discovery campaigns, or if you've been waiting to try them, this is the green light, go for them. They're currently performing fantastically, and I can't get, out, uh, can't get my own clients on it fast enough. And finally, most excitingly, um, growth of social advertising. Now, Facebook has been, of course, a huge platform for a number of years. But just in the past quarter, what we've seen is that Facebook CPMs have fallen about 35% since March. And because there is so much uh, that these CPMs are so much cheaper, um, advertisers are really benefiting. Even if they're having harder times converting, we're seeing the fact that because the cost is so much cheaper, they have 23% lower CPAs on average than they did a couple of months ago. Double that with the fact that Facebook, for the first time in years, had significant growth to their active user base. We're spending more time online and we're particularly spending more time on social media during COVID than we ever did before, um, as we have to, to be social, as um, I'm much more likely to go on Messenger or check in with my friends on social media than I am to, you know, run into them into the street or at work or um, at a bar or a restaurant or something like that. So all of a sudden, there's been this huge flock to Facebook and Instagram specifically, um, even in the regions of North America and Europe, where Facebook's had some, some lackluster growth in the past couple of years. Those numbers are now very positive and it's just increased opportunity to get in front of your audience on Facebook. We see the fact that Facebook and Google work really well together. That normally when we talk about 
CRO and conversion rate optimization on Google, we would say, you know, 96% of people who visit your website leave without making a, a purchase. We would say that 4% conversion rate, well, that's great. If I was able to increase that to 5 or 6%, even better. But outside of that, that still leaves the vast majority of people who arrive at my website, consider my brand, and then leave and never make that purchase. Facebook is that beautiful opportunity to re-engage with that audience through a remarketing campaign or through some kind of other targeting to remind them of that purchase that they didn't complete. We're likely going to interact with several thousand brands over the course of a day or over the course of a week, and I'm going to forget most of them. But how I go about re-engaging and remarketing to them, well, I'm going to leave an impression on those customers and hopefully bring them back to my site, not necessarily at that same moment that they left, but a day, a week, a month later to make sure that I'm still in consideration when they make that next Google search or when they ultimately make that purchase. What we see is not only is it great to get in front of that audience in hopes of bringing them back to your site and converting, but just by showing them an ad several times, by showing them a second ad, we increase the likelihood of them converting by about 60%. But by continuing to show them ads, particularly across multiple networks, I'm able to more than double the likelihood of them converting. So as we think about, okay, how do I make up some of this loss from Google? Suddenly, Facebook and social op, um, present the largest opportunity to us. And so think about that as you think about rebounding from COVID and how we can move forward from all of this. There's a lot of exciting opportunities. As much as there's um, fear and change, there's just tons of opportunity to improve and capitalize on a brave new world. And so guys, I wanna thank you for the time. I wanna make sure that we have enough time for some Q&A, but before that, Amanda, I believe that you had a, a special offer for our guest today. Hi, Mark. Yes, thank you. We do. So I'm going to throw that up as some questions come in. We already had a lot in the chat box, which I'm so grateful for. Um, and I'm happy that this, this presentation really resonated with you all and you enjoyed it today. So Mark obviously just talked about so much different data, different techniques, different things. Um, and it was it has to be during a session like this at a bit of a more higher level. So if you're looking for that kind of expert mark level knowledge to to chat with someone about your specific metrics your specific industry this is the time to sign up wordstream is full of ppc experts that can help you out and really just give you a totally free consultation about like how your metrics are looking maybe how the covid 19 pandemic has affected you negatively or positively and um tr maybe trying to implement some of the things mark talked about today um so while you guys are answering that let's hop into these questions um, so I wanted to kind of take it back to, for those starters, I guess you could say beginners on the line, um, suggestions for defining a budget. Do you have any, is it very industry specific? This person, the person specifically who asked this one doesn't have a set budget yet, works for a small B2B company, privately owned, and is looking to know, you know, how long do I spend and how much should I spend to determine effectiveness of a platform? Yeah. So broadly without getting too specific i would think about it in very small pieces firstly how many people do you need to send to your website to get a customer if you're anticipating three percent conversion rate this is like an average um that means that for every hundred people you send to your website you might get three customers and so if you want to get 30 customers this month, it means that you need to get, uh, oh God, why did I struggle with math all of a sudden? Um, it means that you have to get 30 times 100, 3,000 clicks to your site. Guys, I promise I majored in math. So that means 3,000 clicks to your site to get 30 customers. And if we're anticipating an average cost per click of $2, 3,000 times $2 means $6,000 a month, right? Now, if we have lower expectations about how many customers we want, all of this is very flexible. So think about that end state and you can back into that budget. I would say broadly, there's no reason to, to launch something new if you don't expect to get a customer out of it 
or if you don't expect to get considerable traffic out of it. So I would say that um, as a, a bare minimum, your paid search program shouldn't have lower than $750, $1,000 a month because um, you're going to have a whole lot less return towards that as you have smaller, smaller traffic and those numbers quickly, quickly diminish. You can do it for lower, but it, if I were to be honest about effectiveness, it is a beautiful medium that the more money you put in, pay per click means you're going to get more clicks and ultimately more customers as well. So I'm not sure if I answered the question or if I just danced around it, but um, broadly, I'd say like that 750 number is a, a beautiful starting point. Yeah, I think that's helpful just to give them a ballpark. Um, something else, so I, I've kind of been cataloging some of the questions and kind of working on a little bit more beginner and starter questions and working into something a little bit more specific, but in terms of keyword research um, and different things like that, you know, they're in talking about refreshing your ad copy and your creative, do you have suggestions on the way they categorize their keywords? So, you know, this person is asking reopening versus opening again, COVID-19 versus coronavirus. Um, I'm thinking it has a lot to do with looking at your queries and seeing what your ads are actually turning up for, but I'd be curious at what you would say. Yeah, I think that as, as you start this conversation, if you want to get semantic about like uh, reopening versus opening is a great place to start. How are people phrasing that? A great place to start with that is you can look at Google Trends and that is a open free tool, google.com backslash trends. You can type in any uh, search query or keywords and it'll give you an idea of what that search volume looks like. And you can compare that between reopening and opening. Um, similarly, you can go to wordstream.com backslash keywords, and you can specifically, as you do your keyword research, plan not just what that search volume looks like, but what we estimate um, average cost per clicks would look like in that industry across both Google and Bing. And that gives you a better idea in terms of, to, to the first question as well, um, how much you should expect to put behind that keyword or behind that campaign. It will surprise you that a lot of the a lot of the searches that happen now today are wholly different than they were a couple of months ago. So it's very important that if you haven't done that as an exercise recently, um, that you try it again. Awesome. Um, another kind of more overarching question is: How long do you think um, our audience and advertisers in general should continue to be? sensitive to the copy and the creative you know in terms of seeing people out together and things of that nature now that places are starting to open back up yeah so i think that that's going to differ a whole lot from region to region and um culture to culture right i think that this is a beautiful opportunity as you know new york and uh, Boston and Washington as as places reopen, reopen successfully, that becomes a value add, right? The fact that I can go hang out and be social with people, that ad suddenly resonates with me in a positive light. Conversely, there are other regions that are, are struggling or beginning to hit harder and people do want to see the fact that people aren't together and um, using masks and being appropriate like that. So. I don't have an easy answer to that. Um, I wish I could predict when when all of this is over, right? But I would say be sensitive towards what the what people are doing in your area. Um, if you're able to have people together, getting together, socializing, big groups, that's great. If it's if you're just having people in small groups or, or couples or um, what have you, then it's important that your ads reflect that as well. I would say that just to me, you want to make sure that this ad reaching me today on June 10th reaches me how I could react on June 10th. I would hate to see an ad right now in Boston. I would hate to see an ad with a bunch of friends getting together inside a bar or hopping on a flight together and as if everything were normal. But I suddenly get a lot more optimistic when I see um, ads for me to go out to retail or to hang out with a, a couple of people. Um, so I would say just uh, read the room, see what's appropriate, 
And part of the, the responsive search ads, the responsive display ads, gives us a lot more opportunity to test those different images to see what works best for us, particularly as this continues to change. Um, that responsiveness allows Google to continue to change your ads as, as it sees these kinds of trends shift. Awesome, that makes sense. Now I've got a couple of Facebook questions that came through. Um, someone's asking if you have suggestions on which type of Facebook ad formats, formats to prioritize, um, could that be industry specific or do you have um, suggestions on that overarching? Some of that's gonna come down to your industry. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, like lead formats are very effective at getting people to engage with your brand, give them your email address, what have you, download a white paper. Um, that kind of first action, I'm unfamiliar with this brand, but this offer resonates to me. What you might use that information for is if you get their email address, you reach out to them, or that you put them in a nurture campaign, a drip campaign, or a customer match list so that when they search online, that they later find you on Google. Um, that's a great way to get in front of that kind of audience. Whereas when you start talking about product ads or image ads or carousel ads, um, that might be a little bit lower funnel, right? That that's specifically how you go about converting that customer who is already engaged with you online. Um, I would think about, hey, what, where am I meeting my audience? Well, firstly, I should think about who my audience is, where am I meeting them? in their customer journey with me? And what's the most appropriate ask of them at that point in time? That ask might not always be buy my thing right now. It might be, hey, learn more, subscribe to my newsletter, in which case it's a lead form ad. Or if it really is, hey, I'm talking to my best customers, I want them to buy or buy again, it might be that product ad. Awesome. Um, and how about uh, just a refresher for everyone on the, on the line about what is what it's required to retarget website visitors on Facebook? What is required? So broadly, um, you can for most industries, you simply need to drop that pixel on your site. Um, you can do that using the Facebook pixel or um, WordStream has a pixel that covers both Google, Microsoft, and Facebook to create those remarketing audiences. The only things that you really have to be cautious of um, are specific industries. So healthcare, for instance, is a, a touchy one. HIPAA, the Department of Justice, all of that gets in, they don't want you reaching people based off of sensitive information. Um, so just be cautious of certain industries where remarketing might not be allowed. Beyond that, you can begin to play with um, customer lists, either through Google's customer match or through um, a customer list, just import uh, people's Im email contact information into Facebook or Google. And then Google and Facebook can specifically match that customer list to an end user and reach your audience like that. So if you're doing email marketing or you've got a CRM of your customers or your prospects, um, it's very easy to engage people who are already familiar with your brand on social or display like that. Awesome. Um, another person asked, so now kind of moving over to the Google arena, um, someone asked if you have identified or have best practices or your favorite the best automated bidding strategy to utilize for Google? Do you have a suggestion on that? Yeah, so the biggest thing that I could suggest is you wanna make sure Google Smart Bidding is a great tool, but it's still an automatic thing. Um, if you put in garbage, you're gonna get out garbage. You wanna make sure that your goal that you tell Google to optimize for is your goal. And so most of us, particularly if we're restricted by budget, I would lean towards a maximized conversion bidding strategy. What that will do is it will spend your daily budget and will likely spend all of your daily budget for that campaign, but it will try and get you the cheapest conversions for that, um, for that budget. Versus like a target CPA, if I've got 
a specific price point that I can't afford to acquire people above $15 CPA or $15 cost per conversion. And I have all the budget in the world, so long as I don't spend more than $15 per conversion, then that target CPA or that target row bidding strategy becomes more important in that play. I, what I see very frequently is I see a lot of people either set that target CPA and they don't have a lot of budget, um, or they set that maximize clicks because they want a lot of traffic because a lot of traffic means a lot of conversions in the long run. Very genuinely, you want to sit down and make sure that that end goal is your bidding strategy and then choose your bidding strategy from that rather than um, tell Google a couple of things you're looking at and have it optimize towards towards the wrong one. That makes sense. And and how long should they be running a Google Ads campaign before judging whether it's doing well? Is that objective based or or is there other uh, metrics they should be looking at? It's a little it's a it is objective based. Um, broadly, as the statistician me tells you that you should be spending at least 10 times what you would expect that cost per conversion to be. So if you're looking to get a $100 cost per conversion, it means you just spend $3,000 on the campaign before you really make a decision on it. Um, but as we talk about automated bidding, most of these automated bidding strategies have something like a 14-day learning period, um, during which time you really don't want to change it all too much. So you can see results quickly with Google Ads, um, with all of these automated solutions. But even in that that quickness, um, you want to give it some ramp in the amount of a couple of weeks before you really evaluate it. Awesome. And we only have a couple minutes. So I think I want to end on this last question because I think it really lends itself to kind of the WordStream philosophy and story. Um, but someone on the line asked, you know, straightforward, is it better to hire a professional to run your ads or attempt to do it yourself? What's your suggestion there? Hey, so I'm a professional. At the end of the day, I spend a lot of time looking at paid search. I don't know my business as well as you do. And so when I have this conversation of what's a good CPA, how much do you have to spend? Um, what is the ROI? What is your what is your target persona look like in this region? I don't have that perspective that you do on your business. And particularly as COVID changes so quickly in the United States, in 50 different states on 50 different calendars, I cannot tell you Texas's reopening strategy. I only know what's happening here in Boston. So I do, when I talk to my clients, I rely on them to tell me what their priorities are and what they should be optimizing for. And I can give a lot of these consultive conversations of, hey, based off of what you told me, this is what's the best strategy for you to move forward. But in terms of writing a great ad or what makes you different or what makes you better or what differentiates you from all of your competitors, you know your business so much better and your customers so much better than I do. And so I would say that like, you want to partner in this, but you still need to have a hand in that. And this can look like a software platform. It can look like a consulting conversation. Um, you could choose to partner with an agency, but regardless, you still need to be part of that conversation and make sure that um, you're communicating and that everyone, everyone at the table understands what's going on. Because at the end of the day, you're going to be, your success is the most important. Absolutely. And I think for the agencies on the line is is even just keeping that dialogue that Mark just said in mind. And when you're looking for new customers or clients or prospects, um, having those transparent conversations, making sure you're defining their current state and what they're looking for and really being full transparent and having open communication with your clients the whole time so that they feel like you are um, their right hand in, in their marketing uh, in their online advertising. Um, for those of you who don't want to um, go with an agency, you know, like that is why WordStream exists. It really does help make the world of online advertising easier. And we have a 
team of amazing consultants here that are super skilled in Google, Bing, and Facebook, but WordStream, the software too, that can help you navigate that. And, and you can set up consulting calls and on a cadence. And it's, it's a really great experience. People speak very highly about our consulting services. Um, so with that, I just kind of wanted to end on that positive note. Um, there's lots of different avenues you can take to be successful in online advertising. And hopefully this presentation kind of helps you navigate that a little bit easier. Um, so with that, I guess I will say goodbye and we hope to see you on our next live webinar. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you, everyone.